We do think that perhaps the biochemical changes, the neurotransmitter changes that happen as a result of, of, of starvation, um, of, of involuntary ketosis, um, you know, do play effects on the brain. And I remember my mother saying to me, you know, you're just on your anorexic high. And I didn't really know what that meant. Um, and in the same breath, she would say, I can smell ketones on your breath. You mm. didn't eat your lunch at school today or something. But I think there's a distinct physiological benefit from that restriction in terms of mitochondrial efficacy and ability to go without food and ability to suffer. And if you can then, you know, if you've suffered that long, you know, you can transfer it into the sport. So mitochondrial efficacy, it must be, mm -hmm. it must be there. And then when you have more balance to the physiology, you know, it excels. And I, I know I found that myself once I started to feed myself, to support myself better. Um, you know, for example, if I was to periodize carbohydrate, you know, I was, I've always tempted to restrict carbohydrates, most people with a history of anorexia do. Mm. So when I started to have more, it was like rocket fuel to mm. my mitochondria. So while I went for periods without, and I gave it during races, etc., you know, I would, um, I would excel. Hello friends, it's Mike Mutzel with High Intensity Health. Thanks for being here, thanks for showing up. I'm very excited to be here with Dr. Tamsin Lewis, former professional triathlete and Ironman, and we are in London at the Marion Gluck Clinic. Thanks for being here, it's great to catch up with you in person. Yeah, I'm really yeah. excited to see you in person because I've listened to your shows all the time and learned okay. a lot, so thanks for coming to interview me. Yeah, this is awesome. We were talking offline a little bit about mm. um, eating disorders and how one way through which they may be kind of perpetuated neurologically potentially is through some of the, the positive effects mentally from ketosis. And I, I was pondering this uh, while in the shower one day, like why would someone want to restrict their food so much and maybe the e increased mental energy and aware clarity could be from ketosis. And you were like, yeah, like you were talking about a family history. So I think that's a really good place to kind of launch from. Yeah, okay, we'll start with getting deep and personal. Yeah, um, yeah so I, my history came from, um, I had anorexia from the age of, well, I was diagnosed with anorexia perhaps from the age of 11, I think. Um, so I wasn't classically anorexic. I knew I was, I was really skinny, I was losing weight and all that kind of thing. Um, and one astute physician said to me at the time, your family's got the measles and you've just got the spots. So um, my way of dealing with the situation or the chaos around me and my family was to restrict my eating. Um, you can control it. And there's a lot of emphasis in anorexia placed on the behavior, which is the control around food. And that, uh, the amount of time that takes means you don't have time to think about anything else. But actually, as you've discussed, we do think that perhaps the biochemical changes, the neurotransmitter changes that happen as a result of, of, of starvation, um, of, of involuntary ketosis, um, you know, do play effects on the brain. And I remember my mother saying to me, you know, you're just on your anorexic high. And I didn't really know what that meant. Um, and in the same breath, she would say, I can smell ketones on your breath. You mm. didn't eat your lunch at school today or something. Um, so I just remember thinking about that. And yes, it, the, the, there must be some merit to it. Unfortunately, it's in the context of feeling incredibly anxious as well. Um, and it kind of this motor stimulation you get of your body wanting to move all the time. But there is definitely something to the, the, the clarity and the... And the uh, I don't, or they call it a ketone high now. So, yeah, interesting to explore. There must be some literature around it somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah, have you? I have not heard that the ketone high in that. Context. Um, I've read some literature around involuntary um, starvation and psychological changes in sort of a concentration camps like mm -hmm. Auschwitz. Um, but I would definitely be interested to see if there's any, you know, direct effects of, 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 of the ketones on the bi biochemistry. Mm -hmm. I think. I think it's a different situation from, you know, voluntary ketosis where there isn't the degree of energy restriction, which is obviously causing a massive stress response in someone with anorexia. You know, they're existing on adrenal hormones, cortisol, adrenaline in order to kind of, you know, their body's trying to get fuel from wherever it can, not necessarily exogenous forms of fat. So it's a, anorexia is a hugely catabolic state. So. While one area is very interesting, the effects of ketones on the brain, the other aspect is the effects of glucocorticoids like 
um, like cortisol and um, and the adrenal hormones, which will be elevated in in, in anorexia. Mm-hmm. And especially like long term, as maybe the disease progresses, because body fat would be reduced potentially, so there would be more. Like you mentioned, like gluconeogenesis upregulated from catabolism of, say, muscle and other tissues. Absolutely, yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, yeah. In the in the initial phases, you know, I remember when I started started. I used that. Um, it started as, a, as like a diet, um, and then you know you get lots of positive feedback because you're losing weight. And I was a fairly overweight teenager at the age of eleven. I, you know, I was I was overeating before I went to undereating, so I kind of kind of transcended. But I definitely became a different person as a result of the restricted restricted feeding so yes there would be there's acute effects you know three six months why you still got fat stores to burn but then once you start burning through muscle and even you know I remember hearing my mum um, quoting stories that you know I'd go into heart failure because the body would start eating its heart to all of these things to attempt to shock me into eating you know because I'd uh, I'd go into heart failure and to be fair you know the couple of times I was hospitalized I saw some fairly People that were, you know, on on death's door, um, which was really sad um, because that the, the the chemistry of the anorexia just takes over, and it's almost like the body just gives up, and mm. that was very scary, very scary to watch because I mean, how simple is it, right? You just eat and then you live. Um, but some people that had gone so far literally were willing to die to maintain that physiological state. So um, it was difficult, and I think. You suppress part of your personality. Um, one because of energy restriction, there's just no, there's no fuel to fuel a personality um, or puberty. And um, uh, coming out the other side of that was was very liberating. But you know the body. I think if you, I don't think anyone could be anorexic. I think there has to be a genetic predisposition. Mm. Um, I think it's on the continuum of anxiety disorders. Um, and I think you know you have traits for life. You just transpose them into more, less harmful activities and behaviours. Mm-hmm. And for you, was that athletics? Um, yes, it was. Um, initially, I, I didn't go straight into athletics. I kind of went into a period of um, disinhibited behaviour when I went to medical school and I got away from my family and I was um, drinking too much and, you know, got into boys and and uh, I was at medical school and, and enjoying myself and mm-hmm. I did do a bit of sport but nothing much until one day I realised that sport could potentially save me from the other features which I had, which was depression, anxiety, panic disorder, and exercise was a very effective way of managing that. But, you know, I was medicated for a number of years on Prozac and similar drugs because once you're on them, uh, once some consultant psychiatrist has started you on it's very hard to get off them and very hard to be brave enough in yourself to manage that or to find a doctor that's willing to do it with you and support you appropriately. So I had to, I had to learn and I think, uh, you know, interspersing th- that with sport really helped my brain rewire itself. Interesting. Um, but then it kind of went off track with the uh, head injury, which we'll talk about at some point. Oh, I'd love to get there. Love to get there. But before we move, we move forward, let's kind of finish this off a little bit. Uh, for anyone listening now that's treating a patient with anorexia or, or some sort of restricted eating disorder, like you mentioned. Um, what are some of the breakthroughs that you've learned since now going headfirst in functional medicine, integrative medicine, and biohacking, if you will? What uh, advice would you have been wanting to have given, um, someone have given you back then that you know now? I think th- there's a few things. I think a- approaching diet differently. Um, I remember when I was refed in hospitals, it was all heavy, calorific foods, but you know, overly sugared, sweet foods, which automatically make the body want to crave more and that that makes the physiology feel crap. So it was a self-reinforcing effect of they want to refeed me with X and then Y is going to make me feel crap. So I won't talk about to my ketone high. Mm -hmm. Um, But what would I say? I'd say that a higher fat diet, um, that supportive nutraceuticals, I use omega-3 at a higher dose, 3 to 4,000 milligrams. I use magnesium and B6. Um, I use the methylated, the bio, the body identical forms of B vitamins. Um, so there's the nutraceutical, there's the diet side, which is probably along the same lines as Kelly Brogan, who I learned a lot from around mental health. She's a little bit more drastic in her approach than, than I am, as in never any medication. But um, I've definitely learned a lot from her around, um, around the effects of the gut on mental health and supporting the microbiome. So there's the diet the, the aspect of things and the nutraceuticals and then there's the the, the exercise and mm-hmm. 
you know, unfortunately, as part of anorexia, you become labelled with being an over-exerciser because the part of the physiology drives a sort of this uh, this activity in your body, this this restlessness. But if you can channel that for a greater good with a purpose, which I did, you know, I found that I could um, concentrate on the competition, and then it became more about performance than controlling weight and food. And so I ate for performance um, as opposed to eating to stay well or to please people because yeah. it, you know, it has to come from you. Um, I think and a lot of anorexics are just fed up to get to a certain weight and then there are a certain weight, they, you know, they're automatically, their diagnosis of anorexia gets flipped over their shoulders because they don't meet a BMI criteria, which is nonsense because you know, the psycho psychology is still there. Mm -hmm. So yes, find something that you're passionate about, but it's very hard um, not to become addicted to that passion because, you know, absolutely, um, myself and world champion, four-time world champion, Chrissy Wellington, she's an Ironman world champion, exceptional woman and athlete, she, they had a history of it, she had a history of anorexia and she said, you know, she retired saying, look, I know how good I am and how good I've been, but it's at a, at a physiological cost. And I'm that good because I put everything into it. And it's it's an addiction, you know, it's 100%. And can a professional athlete be more balanced um, in Ironman? I, I think not. And it's one of the reasons I haven't gone back since having my daughter because it's, uh, it's success is always at the expense of something. Something gives to, to perform at that level, family or job or kids, something's going to yeah, give. Yeah, I mean, to it's, very, it's a very selfish occupation. And mm -hmm. yes, you get a lot of positive feedback and you inspire people because you do things that you never thought you'd be capable of. And, you know, the doctor who diagnosed me with anorexia at 11 would, you know, thought I'd be too weak to, to get across the line of an Ironman, let alone win one. So for me, it was very emotional, that journey, just um, learning that I was strong because... Yeah. When you're thin, people automatically think that you're weak. Yeah. Um, and I think learning how to be strong was very was key for me. And I encourage that in former uh, anorexics or anorexics or people with eating disorders in recovery, focus on feeling strong um, as opposed to skinny. Mm -hmm. But a key point here to kind of reinforce is it has to come from within. Kind of that, that meaning and purpose of performance, of meeting those performance goals drove you to eat for performance instead of compromise your performance by maybe not eating, right? So that was a really key step. Absolutely. Um, and, and was that due, because I was craving the neurological high, the, the dopamine and the, the surge of crossing the finish line, knowing that what I was capable of and that I was meeting my, um, you know, what I was capable of. But I don't know, I, I'm increasingly thinking there needs to be more balance. I learned a lot from Ironman and triathlon and professional sport in terms of mental and physical resilience, um, you know, what it, what blood biochemistry looks like, how to balance hormones, how to look at the brain hypothalamic pituitary axis, dysfunction, all that sort of thing. But I don't think it's a healthy preoccupation. I encourage, you know, a lot of my clients are Ironman athletes, they want to do it, but I say, look, do it with a purpose. Don't just do it because everyone else is in the office is doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, do it for something larger than you. Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, and so let's talk about, so you started training fairly late in life. Yeah. I mean, not too late for a female. I know women tend to peak later in endurance sports, but you started training, I think, at 26, became a pro shortly after. And we talked offline about the journey through that and that maybe your history of an eating disorder potentially helped you get there faster, maybe from the mitochondrial biogenesis you were speaking of. Am I mm. off track there? No, you're totally on track because um, it's just a theory that I have in my head. I'm, again, I don't know if there's any research. Probably Dr. Tommy Wood would be able to help us as he's <laughs> read most of the research in this field. Yeah, I, I just came across quite a few people in, in triathlon in particular, and I'm not quite sure what it is about triathlon. Maybe it's a combination of the three different sports. Maybe it's the length. Um, maybe it's the mental determination you need to keep going and mm -hmm. uh, the endurance effect. They came from a history of restricted eating and whether that's anorexia, anorexia bulimia, you know, periods of fasting, whatever context it was, I just noticed that um, that was a, a key theme in a lot. And is it because it's a particular personality type? You know, the type A's are more likely to, to be ultra performers. Um, but I think there's a distinct physiological benefit um, from, that, from that restriction in terms of mitochondrial efficacy and ability to go without food and ability to suffer. And if you can then, you know, if you've suffered that long, you know, you can transfer it into the sport. So 
mitochondrial efficacy it must be mm-hmm. it must be there and then when you have more balance to the physiology you know it 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 excels and i i know i found that myself once i started to feed myself to support myself better um you know for example if i was to periodize carbohydrate you know i was i've always tempted to restrict carbohydrates most people with a history of anorexia do mm. So when I started to have more, it was like rocket fuel to my mitochondria. So while I went for periods without, when I gave it during races, etc., you know, I would um, I would excel. So I definitely think that's something that that is interesting. You know, I'm Chrissy Wellington, as I mentioned, four-time Ironman World Champion. Jodie Swallow, also an Ironman World Champion. Um, all of those, all of those people have had a history of, of severe anorexia. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. So I did a Cat Two bike racing in Colorado, and I noticed a lot of the females that that were trained together uh, in college, and then also in Boulder, uh, Mara Abbott and a few others, oh, yeah. w- fell into that camp as well. So it's it's kind of interesting. I don't know so much for the men, but I don't know if men just don't talk about it. You know, if it's mm. maybe it's taboo, um, but it's, it's very interesting. And, uh, you know, to see someone that's very lean, but so strong, especially climbing in the mountains, which is pretty yeah. fascinating. So you were doing basically, you know, to go back a little bit, doing, you know, um, carb cycling without even before it was cool. You know, this is yeah. like 10 years ago, which is really pretty fascinating because so many people now, this is like the thing, right? Mm. In 2017. Um, so, but you were saying that you don't really test ketones as much you know, that's not but naturally you would go on like a three-hour run three-hour bike ride have water and nuts so obviously we're burning fat for fuel probably mm. making ketones um have you found an advantage in athletes that you've worked with you know as a, as a physician going more into the fat adaptation or what do you recommend um i think you have to meet the person where they're at and i don't think i think a lot of the problems i see is someone here's you know, Dave Asprey, Bulletproof, etc., and say, right, I'm just going to go on a high fat, low carb diet and I'm still going to work 40 hour weeks and I'm still going to train for an Ironman. And then they're like, you know, two months and they're crashed. Um, so I think doing it appropriately is very important. Um, I'm not sure so much around the monitoring, but I, I do say, you know, it takes time to become fat adapted. Yes, my history meant that I can go all day with less energy intake because my mitochondria got very efficient um, but I think for, for a lot of people that you know that's not the case but I, I agree that there's enough evidence now to know that there is a performance benefit from periodization of carbohydrate intake for endurance performance so periods where you're restricting and then periods when you're not um, so that recovery the balance between recovery and adaptation to the training stimulus is balanced mm-hmm. because that, that that can be a problem with um, with people when they go high fat low carb is that they go to obviously you know this it's it's low overall energy availability and then that's when you start to get the brain control of hormones shut down and the thyroid goes a bit funky and uh, everything downstream of that mm-hmm. so would you say to people that say oh yeah ketosis it affects your hormones it affects t3 it affects this is that just not uh, strategically placing enough carbohydrates or enough calories into the equation if you are an athlete of sorts i have to say and i know it'll be interesting when i meet alexander uh, alexandro later this month at a conference um because i know he's he's diehard ketosis some some of the time I've never seen any women do well on a ketosis diet when they're endurance training, ever. And I've, I've seen hundreds of blood tests, um, and every time people have tried to do high fat, low carb, um, something goes, you know, the thyroid and the sex hormones, and you know, something goes out of balance. Mm-hmm. So is it because they're not doing it well? Possibly. I mean, it's hard, I think, to do ketosis well on a, um, in a busy day. You know, people might disagree if you can live on avocados and sardines and, you know, MCT oil. Um, so I try and get people to, to use carbohydrates strategically around exercise. But it has to be it has to be a bit of a balance. And that's why I like looking at data. I've always been about looking at the blood test data and the hormone tests. You know, we use the Dutch test, as you mm-hmm. well know about. So um, for me, that's fascinating. Knowing, yeah. you know, because there is some genetic resilience built in there. You know, some people will be more genetically prone to, to doing well with energy restriction or they might do better with higher fat whereas some people it you know tips them over into metabolic dysfunction. Mm-hmm. And so knowing what you know now about restricted eating yeah. and then now about ketosis in athletics do you see something going on there where maybe for women they are you know training too much or training their calorie intake is not matching the training or is it just the carbohydrate intake is not matching the training? 
and then there's some HPA axis inducement there or? Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think it's really difficult to say, but some people, if you have a history of restricted eating, you're more likely to not meet your energy demands, mm -hmm. okay? Because psychologically and consciously, it's, it's harder for you to, to eat the amount that you need. And that's the, the, the kind of people I see. The other, you know, I, I rarely see many women that are purely ketotic and doing sport, yeah. to be fair. But um, yeah, I'm very interested in, in it as a concept and I like the way it makes, it makes your brain feel. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I'm absolutely certain I've been in ketosis a number of times and then, so, um, but, you know, I, I think people can get too obsessed with it, especially absolutely. women, and do not do it right. Men tend to do it much better than women, probably because, yeah. I don't know, the, the perfectionism psychology takes over, not <laughs> exclusively, but, you know. Yeah. I, I do hear, I do get messages about that quite often. Um, so let's go back a little bit to, um, to time-restricted feeding. I know this sure. is kind of a popular topic. How do you blend that, um, you know, because we know calorie restriction can have all these benefits, right? Sure. Certain, or f compressing that feeding window. Um, how do you recommend that to patients, potentially that may have a history of, of eating challenges and things like that? What would, you re what would be your advice there, or do you have any tips for folks? Um. I mean, I don't focus ex uh, that much on the dietary side of things. I, I, I ask people around it because I can't do everything. Um, I work with a health coach and nutritionist who is, you know, bulletproof trained. And so she advocates that more, that, 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 that approach. But you get people that have different ideas around what they want to eat. And if you tell them to go and eat a certain way and there's stress in their life and there's other things, they, they don't want to do it. So you have to work around them. But uh, there's definite benefit, as you said, to time-restricted feeding, to having periods of 12, um, 12 hours fasting. And Michael Mosley, who's very famous in this country, did the 15-2. I don't know that one. Not the whole much. concept is just, you know, periodizing eating and not eating for a large portion of the day. And, and we know now that that sets the microbiome, resets the microbiome, that, you know, you will be getting periods of, uh, of fat metabolism as well, which is, is ultimately beneficial for the mitochondria. And But, yeah. uh, you know, there also is a subset of the population that then underdo it and become chronically calorie restricted and then have problems with nutrient absorption, gut dysfunction and hormonal imbalance. So it's, it's a balance trying it's to figure a balance. it all out. And it's getting people in this era of overwhelming amounts of information. What should I do? You know, because even I as a you know medical doctor, loads of experience in this arena, very interested, read the research, you know, look look at some people on your podcast and go, Oh wow! But they can do ketosis mm -hmm. strictly. I'm going to do it. You know what? <laughs> and then um, you just want to jump on a bandwagon and do it just for the sake of doing it. But sometimes um, I, I encourage people just to, to get to know themselves a bit better and, and look, look at what makes them feel good. Yeah. And um, we've started using some of the 24-hour glucose monitors. I just sent one to Tommy in the states because apparently you can't get them easily. There. They're hard. Yeah, I might need to talk to you offline about that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So I find that really interesting. You know, you're having a little, you scan it with your phone. You see the effects of a food and life. Stress, blood glucose. travel. Yeah. And um, for me, it was really interesting because the thing that affected it the most was stress. Mm -hmm. And I know that you know cortisol is higher in the morning, and then my blood glucose go up and Whereas, you know, I'm very sensitive to insulin, so, uh, you know, it, my blood glucose tended to be a, a lot lower. And when I had alcohol, for example, a glass of wine, it would drop, which kind of means I, I probably had an overshoot of insulin. And then, so I use those as tools to kind of get people to engage with their physiology and to see, you know, how different foods and how different lifestyle factors affect them. Mm -hmm. Because in this industry, and I, I know being a performer athlete as well, we're immersed in kind of like a, this culture of what well, we used to call it either TTFU or HTFU, so toughen the F up, mm -hmm. which is really sad because, you know, a part of that is, is true, you know, there needs to be some time in your life spent around resilience and developing mental toughness, but, you know, sometimes you need to be a bit kinder to yourself, know when to take the brakes off, and um, I still struggle with that, and I know a lot of people do, because, there's so much to do, and uh, you know, it's knowing, as you say, the the four pillars. Addressing those is is key.
Absolutely, yeah, and we're, we're reinforced every time we go on social media or read books about grit and hustle and the grind, you know, whether it's in our business or in our personal life or fitness, up at five in the morning, and, and so we're, we sometimes don't reward some of the rest and recovery, which leads me to kind of my next point we were talking offline about what you would do differently had you, if you were to go back and, and, and the pursue the professional triathlon Ironman sport. What would you do differently to kind of optimize your HPA axis? Mm. And, and you mentioned gut health and things like that. Like mm-hmm. those are kind of rest and repair, kind of slowing down. What would you do differently to maintain that high level of performance while as trying to optimize health at the same time? I would have been an earlier adopter of a change in diet because I was like most athletes like cereal and dairy and um, you know rice and pasta and all that stuff. And um, I was still a bit scared of fat on, you know, had my Muller lights as well. Um, so I really much switched over to a higher fat diet and that correlated with an improvement in my performance as well. Um, working on my gut a bit because I mean, there's a legion of, of, of triathletes, of all athletes, of endurance athletes out there with, with gut dysfunction. Um, you know, it's, ex- endurance exercise can be highly damaging to the gut, especially if you're in the heat. So yeah, addressing the gut, incorporating a higher fat diet, um, making sure you have enough nutraceutical support, you know, the vitamin D, the omega-3, um, the B vitamins, support your adrenals, perhaps some adaptogenic herbs that we know Rhodiola has some evidence for, ashwagandha too, we use both of those. I would have done that. Um, I would have come off the birth control pill a lot earlier mm. because I see that a lot in athletes, you know, oh, periods are just bothersome. Um, Get them out of here. Get them out of here. Just go on a, <laughs> yeah. a synthetic hormone. And you know what? Every single doctor conventionally trained thinks the pill is like a wonder drug. And um, especially for athletes, it binds, it raises the level of SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin, reduces your level of free testosterone, which in some women is why it's used, so they can treat PCOS and skin problems. But actually, free testosterone as an endurance athlete is really damn important. So um, for me, coming off that and seeing my levels come up was um, I, it correlated with an increase in performance almost immediately oh, wow. um, within within a couple of months. Um, so, but I was on that, you know, like most people, probably I don't know, fifteen years, probably, you know, I didn't even think about it. Yeah. Um, but I know it was probably correlated with the stress fractures. I had a couple of stress fractures, um, being on a low estrogen pill, those kind of things. And I hear those stories repeated. You know, of, of of women that go on certain types of pill and have um, problems with recovery and um, you know tendon damage and stress fractures and or, and also the the lack of muscle strength. Hmm. So yeah, for, that was one thing. Um, I was lucky enough to get really light, but I did get cycles back. And you know, I it's um, interesting for me because I actually got I got pregnant the day before winning the Ironman. Oh my goodness. So, That's amazing. Um, yeah, it was bizarre, and maybe it was a testament to well, I was quite calm and I felt well by that time. Um, but um, it was a surprise because you know I was like eleven percent body fat, mm-hmm. and um, I'm sure there was stress. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so I do see. I I, I I use that as an example just to say that I'd got a lot of things by that time right. Um, I was focusing on on wanting to win an Ironman but I recognized that I needed more balance in my life. I supported my hormones better, I was eating better, I was not energy restricted, I was good weight, you know, I think I was 56, 57 kilos, and I'm 168 centimeters, so I was probably a BMI of like 20. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so all of those things. And I would encourage people to, to try more, a much more natural approach because there's an over obsession and a marketing push with the nutrition companies for you need 80 grams of carbohydrate an hour in order to perform yeah. and I know absolutely that that's not the case um, but I do think that carbohydrate and endurance sport plays its pace just become better at using it and knowing that you can spare your glycogen for longer if you're fat adapted. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think being better fat adapted and that kind of approach helps heal the gut. And um, by all means, test your gut. And uh, I told you that we do quite a lot of gut testing now because I see, you know, low level parasites, dysbiosis all the time. And treating that um, is, is, is key because yeah. everything upstream improves. It's really interesting you mentioned the parasites and the, this um, kind of this epidemic of like, um, I don't even know, with obstacle course racing, there's the Tough Mudder and there's a bunch Correct, of these. Yeah. So people are, are diving into water 
um, like tens of thousands of people are going through the same water. So I'd imagine in one end, it's a good way to increase bacterial diversity because you're exposed to a lot of different microbes potentially, but also to get exposed or inoculated to different pathogens and parasites. And yeah. so uh, as an endurance athlete, you know, we're you know, training and drinking, sharing water bottles, doing a lot of that. And you noticed increased levels of different parasites um, after living in Thailand and training in Europe and things like, things like that. So um, what gut testing specifically have you found to be most effective? So it took me a long time to actually self-test ignorance is bliss and the gut and I haven't, still haven't done my Dutch test because I'm not ready to tackle my cortisol. Yeah. Uh, but I use a lot of gut testing in a athletes and um, we see you know, high levels of blastocystis hominis, which you know, we know is common, but you know, at higher levels and if it's symptomatic, you should treat probably. Um, we see Giardia, um, Diantamoeba, Fragilis, Mm. Um, I use the combination of the GI map and doctor's data, comprehensive storm parasitology, two-day test. Cool. Um, and, but, you know, I think, are you going to have gut dysfunction if you do weekend tough mudders? Probably not. But if you're an endurance training athlete running high glucocorticoids, cortisol levels, your immune system's already taxed, um, you're going to be less likely to have you know, uh, immunity in the gut and the, and the good bacteria to fight to fight off these bugs. And I think that's what we see, low-level um, infections over a long period of time, depleting the immunity mm -hmm. on top of an immune system that's already taxed by having to train 15, 20 hours a week and um, all the other life stresses. Yeah, so the training-induced changes in the environment and the immune system kind of foster this growth of blasto, which when I was training 25 hours, 25 hours a week, I did the Genova test. This was back mm. in 2006 really high levels of blasto and I used tinidazole and that seemed to work fairly well. Yeah. It was off the charts, so I had a lot of GI symptoms and it seemed to really, you know, after taking that, it's like a flagell-like compound, right? Tinidazole, yeah. metronidazole, seemed to really help. Uh, Is that, was that just two days, of course, or did you take it for a week? I, I believe, it, I can't remember at this, it was a long, over 10 years ago, right? Um, oh, right, okay. But I believe it was two, five, 500, I could be wrong, I could be wrong on the dosing, but it was two capsules, I believe, for 10 days. It was a while, oh, okay. much longer. Um, and at that time, we didn't have the data on taking probiotics concomitant, you know, sure. with the, with these things. So, anyway, very you interesting. And in, yeah. it's hard because I have to convince people to go on um, antibiotics who are immersed in the functional medicine movement. Who's like, all antibiotics are terrible. We should never take them at any cost, and we'll be dying before we take antibiotics. Um, you know, you have to give context, right? There's a period of treatment. Mm -hmm. You know, use Saccharomyces, use high quality probiotics alongside and you're less likely to suffer the consequences and the microbiome does bounce back yeah and it'll bounce back more if you get rid of the really nasty stuff right. that's depleting you um but yeah it's um yeah interesting but some people feel really good when they start taking antibiotics but you do get diet reactions as well so mm -hmm. um but yeah so it's all interdependent awesome yeah. so we talked about a lot of things so right now one thing that you want to do more of is yoga you're talking about that. Yeah, I love running. I still manage to be quite good at running despite not doing much. I think all the endurance background and base. But I had a resistance to yoga for a number of years because it involves sitting still, breathing, flexibility. Um, none of those I was very good at, but I know that I need it because um, I feel tightness in my chest and um, I know that my cortisol has been long, high for a long time. Mm -hmm. Uh, for a number of reasons, starting a business, having a child, actually that was the main thing, the major stressor of my stress bucket was having a, having a child who's now two and mm. sleepless nights and all that comes with it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so um, yoga is definitely hot, I, um, hot yoga, I, I prefer hot yoga because I like sweating, I think that's a euphorogenic process, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, anything that combines saunering and exercise I'm, I'm good on, but it's hard not to be competitive when you see all these people on them. Um, on YouTube or even your yoga teachers doing all these fancy poses and like, eh, I can't do that. Yeah, it's really, yoga's transformed, I feel like, in the last few years where it's gotten to more, much more inversions and different things where it used to be more about Bikram, I feel like back in like 2004, 2005, Bikram was a thing. Then hot, hot, hot yoga is kind of an extension of Bikram and now we're into this inversion era. And you yeah. see so many posts on Instagram where people are doing inversions and different things, which is cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it, but is it more <laughs> is it becoming more competitive and yeah. getting away from the true, the, true the pranayama type breathing yeah. and presence and being? But um, I have to say, just for the whole yoga class, um, my brain was totally focused on the poses and the movements and the breath, mm -hmm. and I it was kind of like an aha moment for me because I, I run a lot, you know, for headspace. Even if it's half an hour, I just run out the door. But during that time. 
I'm either looking at the pace or I'm, I'm still whirling away on the stress of the day or what I should be doing or what I haven't done or relationship issues or whatever. But during that hour of yoga, that, that went and I'm thinking, yeah, I need to do this. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, I love that you brought that up because I have a, a disagreement with my wife on this very issue where she'll say that, that running is her meditation. But the brain, the, that monkey brain doesn't really turn off during athletic sports. I mean, you do get that euphoria and it's calming afterwards, but there's a distinct difference between the, the meditation yoga style mindset versus like the, the mental clarity that you garner from endurance athletics. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, there is mindfulness running where you, you listen to the foot hitting the ground and you count your breaths and I'm like, oh, bored already, yeah. you know? Yeah, thinking about other things. I think because it's just one, two, one, two, and, you know, there's all this environment, whereas if you're doing a, a dynamic yoga movements, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's lots of, um, your neurological system is, is more taxed. Yeah. And I think, you know, we, we didn't touch on the head injury, but, you know, I yeah. have recovered from a severe head injury. Um, I was in a coma following a skiing accident in 2004, um, and, you know, they told me I wouldn't make it through and they called my parents and said, you, you know, if you want to come, you should come now. Um, I had a lot of brain swelling and they had me on high dose anti-epileptics. Anyway, the, I did come through, um, but it was a long process of recovery and no one knew why I was feeling and behaving the way I did in a conventional medical mindset. It's like, here, here's your anti-anxiety drug, here's your sleeping drug and here's your Prozac for your depression. And, um, we won't look at the fact that your nervous system is fundamentally not working properly. Um, so that's, uh, coming back to the yoga point, I've noticed that it's very good for the nervous system, the brain control of the muscles, that kind of thing. And I, and I know I need more of that because a very, while I'm good at running and I want to do it and it gives me the, the high, um, I think we need to be more engaged with our neurological health and our brain health and ways to support that. And I, I, I think uh, yoga is just one aspect of that. Mm -hmm. Obviously the dietary changes, um, you know, targeted use of nootropics I use sometimes as well. Um, yeah, and also all the other four pillars, you know, the socially, socializing, the community, the sense of purpose all help. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. But, um, still on that journey, but it's, um, it's an interesting one. Yeah. So the head, the head trauma, that was like mm. downhill skiing, alpine skiing, yeah. uh, prior to med school or after? Um, I was in my final year of med school oh and I was on the slopes in Calgary, actually. Um, it, it was really bad visibility and I was with a, a couple of junior doctors that were the year ahead of me. And if I hadn't been with junior doctors, I absolutely certainly died because I hit my, I hit my skis stuck and I flew forward. I hit the slope. And then I flew back and hit the back of my head, so like a contra-coup injury. Uh, and I sat up, and the interesting thing is I remember this. Today, even to now, I remember it, they kind of, which is a good sign for the brain, you know, that there's, there was no post-retrograde um, amnesia of the event. So I remember sitting up and I looked at the junior doctor who I was with, Tom, and I said, I dreamt this, I knew this was gonna happen, then I had this overwhelming sense of deja vu, which is probably just a massive release of neurotransmitters. Um, and trauma and and then I passed out and I started fitting on the slope right there and then so they gave me mouth to mouth um, called for an air ambulance and I got airlifted to the hospital and um, yeah it didn't had a lot of brain swelling and as I said the journey of recovery from that is um, was hard mm -hmm. and I think you know it's really helped having more personalities and media people talk about head injuries now because we know that the effects can be very subtle and not picked up by a conventional medical model you know, depression, hypersomnia, so sleeping too much, um, you know, changes in your, in your body in, in terms of uh, muscle strength and, and, you know, cognitive function, brain clarity. I mean, God, how I got through medical finals, I do not know. I dropped from the top centile of my year to like the, um, the, the, the bottom third, but I, I still got through. Yeah. But concentration, you know, declarative memory, that kind of thing was very, very much affected. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. And, you know, going back even 10 years ago, we didn't, when that happened, right, roughly, yeah. uh, we didn't have all the feedback or the information upon about brain plasticity and neurofeedback and the ability to really kind of preemptively, like using maybe exogenous ketones and things like that during that time yeah. that we do now, we know. Kind of a, I think we're better, people are better equipped to manage their brains after trauma 
in 2017. Absolutely, it's really so it's exciting, impressive. you know. I would have definitely been on my MCTs and my carnitine. Yeah, yeah, right <laughs> away. took carnitine straight away and my high dose omega-3 and... Mm -hmm. So um, forophane, yeah, all that curcumin, hey? Yeah, absolutely. All those compounds. They do work and, you know, I was, I was so skeptical because we're taught to be skeptical because it's pharma or nothing yeah. in, in conventional medicine. And if, the, if, if nothing else, I'm so passionate about trying to say that there is another way and let's bring some medical credibility to an alternative approach. And I know you're about that too. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I don't want to be sitting alongside, you know, homeopathy, which people are still very skeptical about. Yeah. Um, but knowing that, you know, yeah. Anyway, we're sold on that lifestyle medicine and all the uh, all the bits around it. Yeah. But you know, part of our, our approach is is you know it's, it's bioidentical hormones appropriately. But um, I know you had Dave Asprey talking about possibly inappropriate use of bioidentical hormones. But um, the Marion Gluck Clinic here is one of the leading centres of bioidentical hormones in the UK, and um, I've been very interested by their approach. They mm -hmm. compound all the hormones. Um, but it's massive in America. It's not so. It's not so big here. But um, yeah, it's Brilliant. All, all part and parcel. So I'm, I'm just happy to be on, you know, part of this community. And it is a community, right? You mm -hmm. know, the functional space is. And I'd like to. I'm at the moment building a team um, in the UK of, of like-minded practitioners and getting the technology in order to to represent the data and engage patients. So um, I'm excited to be doing that because in in the UK, functional medicine is still very fragmented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a handful of practitioners that are practicing it, but kind of on their own, right? So that's what yeah. you're trying to do, bring people together. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's very time intensive, you know, practicing this approach, as you know, you know, you can only take on so many patients, it's expensive, and therefore with expense comes skepticism, because you're like, oh, you're just making money out of this. But mm -hmm. no, you're like, these tests cost money. And um, I think having a team is, is much more impactful, you know, a health coach that really understands the data and really can talk to you and, you know, partner with you, I think yeah. it's... It's good. So P4 medicine, as you've heard. Yes, exactly. Brilliant. So you mentioned lifestyle medicine. So that's kind of the, how we'd like to end the show, as you know, sure. Dr. Damson. So let's talk about your favorite exercise. If there was one thing you just could not live without, uh, or and only one exercise that you could do for the rest of your life, what would it be? Running on or cycling up mountains, <laughs> um, being in nature, moving, breathing, stretching. So maybe run, dynamic yoga, run. But in, in nature, I Outside. think, uh, I'm, I, you know, I grew up on a farm, but it wasn't until I spent years in the city that I realized that my, my psychology, my physiology needs nature and space, and I feel very grounded amongst it. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Yeah. And uh, this, um, along those same lines, a favorite herb, nutrient, botanical, just one thing you couldn't live without, what would it be? <laughs> uh, I, I'm increasingly fond of ashwagandha, and mm -hmm. I use the, the liposomal curcumin reservatrol. Um, so those two combo with a bit of omega-3 doused in um, are, are kind of things that my go-to's. Cool. Yeah. Do you have any circadian rhythm bias with those? Like you find they work better in the morning or at night or just take them when you remember? Uh, I tend to take ashwagandha in the evening because uh, I haven't tried it in the morning, but physiologically in my head I feel like it's going to be a calming thing and in the day I need to do so much. So if I'm too zoned out to do stuff, then... Um, then it's not the best time. But I guess if I go on holiday or have a weekend, I'm more inclined to take it. In the morning, morning. just so you're kind of zen and Yeah, and, real and I use, you know, a combination. I use, sometimes I use L-theanine and magnesium and, um, yeah. Cool, but awesome. Definitely, I think one of the most effective sleep enablers for me is a, is a just an Epsom salt, magnesium sulfate bath with mm -hmm. lavender. Um, I tend to get to sleep much better after that. Yeah, me too. Sauna as well. I, I found that. Or hot yoga, like we were talking about. That could really enhance deep sleep. Deep sleep, yeah. yeah. It's all, um, all good. Along those lines, uh, deep sleep is really important for health, but deep sleep kind of starts in the morning. Yeah. So what's your ideal morning routine? My morning routine, if I didn't have my toddler running about yeah. um, asking for her Bix and goat milk, would be, um, would be 15 minutes of yoga, um, setting a purpose for the day. I, I do have some licorice and peppermint tea in the morning and then I put on a pot of coffee. Um, I do like coffee, I only have it in the morning generally, but um, with some MCT oil. Um, and then I answer my emails, um, but ideally I'd like to have a sauna in the house mm -hmm. and, um, and do some hot yoga in Brilliant. the morning. And then, um, and then I'll have a smoothie. So greens, um, fats, you know, avocado, hemp, uh, turmeric sheep and goat whey I use. I'm not dairy free, but I don't use whey, total whey, because it upsets me a bit. Um, so yeah, really nutrient dense smoothie. And then onwards, sometimes I take some 
nootropics I've been experimenting with, mm -hmm. um, a little bit with qualia, which is a, a stacked nootropic. I also occasionally use Tim Ferriss's favorite, phenylpiracetam. Mm -hmm. um, but I think all of these things probably come at a biological cost and um, Tommy is kind of a mentor of mine Dr. Tommy Wood, and he always says there's no biological free lunch yeah um, and you know someone with my history that's prone to you know instability and, and, and uh, anxiety and depression I occasionally use 5-HTP at night mm. and I think uh, that definitely helps uh, moods and also with um, also with carbohydrate craning and just generally feeling calmer so I use a sort of a stacked nootropic um, blend in the evening, which is 5-HTP, magnesium, valerian, B6, those kind of things. Yeah. And it affects carbohydrate cravings, like maybe I've sweets noticed. and things. Yeah. Um, specifically in the, in the menstrual period when the, the last part of the month is your, your estrogen's dropping and your progesterone's high. Carbohydrate craving at that time of the month is usually higher and I, I noticed that 5-HTP improves that. Yeah. Interesting. Um, tryptophan, not, not so much because it has the potential to go in the gut to quinolinic acid, so I sort of one step up the chain, but I know some practitioners use a combination of 5-HTP and L-tryptophan. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely find that helpful with people. Yeah. And I also, if there's cravings generally, I also use tyrosine support as well in the day for people. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah Eric Braverman has talked about that quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you know Roger Billica in Colorado too. They created uh, a sort of a neurotransmitter assessment profile, yeah. but they, they do like to pair, you know, kind of like tyrosine during the day and then the 5-HTP at night and sometimes the DL phenylalanine with the tyrosine for all the kind of dopaminergic type. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. I do. Um, I, I've become very interested in that and we work with Designs for Health in the, in the States and I know that um, they're, they're all physician created you know, blends like Dopa Boost and stuff. And, yeah. Yeah, they tend to work with people when used properly. Yeah. Um, you don't don't overdo it because I see some people on five HTP and they're taking like three hundred and then they're becoming borderline serotonergic syndrome and anxious and hot and sweaty. So you know, balance and working with someone that really gets you and understands mm -hmm. where you're at and what you're doing. It's key. Balance mm -hmm. is key. Love that. So if you were to bump shoulders with a parliament member, maybe someone from the World Health Organization in an elevator, they said, "Dr. Lewis, what should I do? What sort of policy should I implement to improve the health of the masses?" What would you like them to know? I, I think kind of in creating more, I know some sort of governments are doing this, more social space, more community space, more public awareness around, you know, a lifestyle medicine approach, the most bang for your buck interventions to help improve people's life, which is, you know, the sense of community, the eating well, the sharing food, the breaking of the bread. So I would encourage any, any you know, public health uh, guru to, 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 to try and encourage more spaces for that. Um, and to prevent social isolation. Mm, that's key. Everyone's mm. talking about that now, which is so critical. The social iso isolation, that last part you mentioned. Yeah, and I think a lot of very hard dri driven types think, I don't need that. Why do I need that? You know, I've got my nice, cozy environment. I've got my successful workplace. I don't need to socialize. And they find it hard. You know, there's a lot of social anxiety amongst people. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I think doing bits is, is definitely helpful and uh, encouraging it. It's key. Love it. Thanks so much for sharing all your info. So if folks want to connect with you online, yeah. what's the best resource for them? Um, I would go through my Twitter profile, SportyDoc, uh, that's with Nai, and also my SportyDoc.com is my my sporting website, but DrTanzanurse.com is going to be launching very soon. And we've got some other exciting things happening um, with a company called Omixy, O-M-X-Y.com who uh, have a very neat technology platform that we're going to be using to enable uh, clients to engage with their data and change their lives. Brilliant. And then the Marianne Gluck Clinic, is what's the URL for that if people are listening? So images? they are um, mariegluckclinic.com. Okay. It's, it's one of the highest ranked in Google for bioidentical hormones in the UK. All of the doctors here have a functional approach. Some are more knowledgeable than others about the approach, but it's safe practical and compounded bioidentical hormones, which, um, yeah, make you feel and function a lot better. Yeah, absolutely. All right, friends, thanks so much for tuning in. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. I'll put a link in the show notes to the websites we mentioned in the YouTube description below. 